thank you very much, Mr. President. And all I can say is that uh, the Honourable Lady has put the fear of God into me as I sit here trying to counter that fantastic speech. I learned more about the President's love life than I could ever have hoped, to, ever have <laughs> begun to dream. And if I were him, I must say, I would have experienced a little bit of fear had I known how deeply and closely my personal life was going to be discussed in this august company. But ladies and gentlemen, when you go through those doors at the end of the debate tonight, and when you vote for fear over love, you will be taking the road less traveled. You will be doing the unusual thing. You will be making the unusual choice. And I am here to try to persuade you to vote for the pressure on the diamond, to vote for the grit in the pearl, to vote for the fear that makes love possible and that makes love work. After such a magnificent speech, and it absolutely was magnificent, I feel churlish uh, correcting the librarian on a key, indeed foundational, part of her argument to this house. She said that Machiavelli only just, only slightly preferred fear to love. I regret to tell you, honorable members, that that is not true. Um, I am well known to be a fastidious researcher and uh, on the train on the way up, here uh, earlier this evening, I googled Machiavelli's The Prince, which I have never read, and I read the chapter on love and fear and thus speak as an authority in front of you this evening. And I can confidently say that Machiavelli did not slightly prefer fear over love where there was a forced choice. Indeed, he wrote his entire chapter arguing why fear should be preferred over love. And the Honourable Lady has given us many salient and uh, factual examples of terrible regimes, Swaziland, uh, Russia, elsewhere, China, uh, authoritarian regimes that are absolutely terrible where fear alone rules. But I am glad that she grounded her argument in Machiavelli's, uh, in Machiavelli's setting. Because in fact, anybody that has actually read this chapter, like myself, on the train on the way up to Oxford, will know that Machiavelli made it quite clear that the kind of fear that public leaders should aspire to uh, evoke in those who they are ruling or leading in any way whatsoever was not the kind of fear that the Honourable Lady discusses. Indeed, Machiavelli said that such fear versus love must always be kept separate from hatred. He was quite clear about that. He went on about it again and again. He said, fear that is accompanied by hatred because the ruler is oppressive, because they are you're afraid for not just for a good reason, but for any reason, for a capricious reason, that this doesn't work. So as a matter of fact, none of the Honourable Lady's examples in fact apply to the debate of fear versus love in the public sphere. Furthermore, moved though I was by the Honourable Lady's um, lovely tales of her family, I too have a very loving family and I wouldn't want to throw them under the bus by saying that they made me afraid every day, although my mother does sometimes still make me afraid, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, this is, the debate is not about personal relationships, of course it cannot be. We are societal animals, we are made for pair bonding, we are made for familial bonding. Obviously, love is very important to us. But it is fear, it is fear that enables societies to run correctly when fear is properly understood. Uh, you might think, and you would be right, that I am incredibly courageous, and that Omarosa and uh, my honourable friend here are very courageous getting up against such a massive amount of intellectual firepower on the side of the Beatles uh, from uh, Mr. Secretary's hometown. How are we supposed to counter one of the world's leading neuroscientists one of the world's leading ethicists and the Bishop of Oxford representing God himself. <laughs> I, would call that, I would call that a bit of a sticky wicket, but we are here nonetheless because it's the right thing to do. And I would remind my Lord the Bishop that as the Bible itself teaches us in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now let us move on to the practical applications of Machiavelli's dictum in the real world today. When we look at the war in Ukraine, the single greatest uh, uh, current event that is influencing the world as we see it today in Europe, 
We see, obviously, and I'm sure that there's no member of this House that would disagree with this, an illegal invasion that is completely unprovoked, genocide, torture, the worst of the worst, coming indeed from a ruler who governs only by fear, but not in Machiavelli's, uh, not in Machiavelli's way, because as we see from the recent events in the Belgorod People's Republic, his fear is accompanied by hatred, so he doesn't count. Let us look at some of the positive and negative reactions to the war in Ukraine by those outside of it. I put it to this house that the desire to be loved and the repudiation of fear, the, the, the unwillingness to be feared, to be seen to be negative, is something that has poisoned the response to the war in Ukraine in too many people. Let us take President Macron, the president of France, Obviously, France is a member of NATO, and the French have given a number of weapons to Ukraine. That's absolutely fantastic. But Mr. Macron, in his desire to be seen as a peacemaker, in his desire to be all things to all men, in his desire to speak to the East the way he speaks to the West, decided that he would take it upon himself to be the mediator to both sides, this appalling conflict, in a way that it cannot be uh, that cannot properly be done. He spoke to President Putin when he should not have done. He embarrassed his nation. He embarrassed NATO. And he gravely offended the Ukrainians, who knew that they had been invaded and that the time for talking was obviously over. President Putin toyed with him like a cat with a mouse, humiliated him by lying to him. And then Mr. Macron still didn't have enough. He still wanted to wrap that mantle of peacemaker around him. This is the geopolitical equivalent of today's chasing of clout, of today's chasing of social media likes, of Instagram ability, of TikTok views. Everybody is so absolutely terrified to be seen to doing anything negative that they won't stand up and do the right thing. Going back again to, uh, the, uh, to the Lord and to the Bible as a Catholic, a very poor Catholic, but nonetheless a Catholic, I regret to say that Macron's fault was taken to extremes by my holy father, the Pope, who, again, shamefully in my opinion, in a racist, frankly a racist manner, decided that he would attempt to both sides this conflict, to pacify the Russians, to say it was NATO's fault, a purely defensive alliance for building up on the Russian borders, and oh, by the way, it couldn't have actually been the Russians who did this, it must be those nasty Dagestanis from Asia. I was unutterably shocked to hear such racist sentiments coming out of the mouth of the Pope, who is the head of the church on earth, and the Pope's moral authority has been fundamentally undermined by his desire to be loved by everybody. Sometimes you can't be loved by everybody if you want to do the right thing. And to misquote PJ O'Rourke, when it comes to a genocidal invasion of a peaceful country, by a brutal dictator and his brutal regime, all I have to say is give war a chance. Because Britain's reaction, which was to send weapons, not to talk, to war war instead of jaw jaw, was absolutely the right one and saved countless Ukrainian lives. And it isn't only war where fear, properly understood as Machiavelli had it, fear absent of hatred, beats love. It's also the public square. It's also intellectual debates. I am extremely proud, as I heard from the president, that this house is to host Professor Kathleen Stock in a couple of days, that she will be coming here, parche all of the protests, parche Aozu, parche all of those junior common rooms that passed the pathetic little motions saying that they were terrified of her speech, of her ideas. This is Oxford. Are you sure that you're in the right place? Certainly, yes, sir. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for his point of information, and I acknowledge that they didn't literally refer to Catherine's, Kathleen Stock, but they tied it, everybody knows, entirely to her presence here. It wasn't a coincidence that they did this, and it wasn't a coincidence that the motions in the various JCRs passed about Professor Stock were conducted in coordination with the Oxford Union uh, Student Union, AUSU. And it reminds me, ladies and gentlemen, ever anew, that AUSU, 
is for those people who can't hack it in the union, and that Christchurch Junior Common Room is for those people who can't hack it in Christchurch. And I really speak from experience on that one. The five people that show up to Christchurch Junior Common Room, and I can assure you it's never more than five people, that are on the hard left of the party and that desire to suppress free speech, embarrass me as a member of the House as well as a member of this House. Now, as it happens, I agree with Professor, uh, Professor Stock, and I'm not ashamed to say so. I think it's important to pin your colours to the mast on these issues. I have never misgendered any trans person. I will always refer to them in the way that they wish to be referred to. But the idea that it is controversial or shameful to talk about biological sex in my opinion, it is only controversial or shameful because it is a tautology. What other kind of sex is there apart from biological sex? The fact that this is even being discussed, even a concern, even a topic of endless leaders in the Times, leaders in the Guardian, all that says, all that says is that love and the desire to be liked and the desire to offend nobody, nobody at all, has become paramount in public life. Ladies and gentlemen, when you march through that door and you bravely take up the unpopular side of fear versus love, you will be saying that there is more to life than clout, that there is more to life than social media, that there is more to life than being loved by everybody and that being all things to all men. You cannot truly have love and free expression without the fear that gives it space to breathe. One last thing I would say about fear, working on the Honourable, but something the Honourable Lady said in her excellent speech that um, reminded me to say this. When you have true fear, as properly understood in a leader or a politician or a professor or a public speaker, it is because the public, your followers, your soldiers, trust you. You don't fear anybody if you don't think they are going to do what they say they are going to do. That's why Mr. Macron's arguments were so dangerous. That is why Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, and Germany's actually been one of the biggest donors to Ukraine in terms of weapons, that's why his hesitancy is poison. The enemy has to believe that you will do what you say you are going to do in order to fear you. Otherwise, they won't care what you say. It's just yap, yap, yap. It's just more uh, unimpressive noise. But I know that this house is impressive. I know that this house will welcome Professor Stock, whether they agree with her or disagree with her, when she comes to speak. And I would ask you to remember that when the Oxford Union came out of its shell in terms of public life in Britain in general, it was because it passed one of the most unpopular motions that has ever been passed in this house. And that was, of course, in World War I, when this House voted, this House will not fight for king and country. Unlike with Professor Stock, I, had I been allowed to be a member of the House back then, which I wouldn't have because I'm a woman, I would not have agreed with that motion. But that's not the point. The undergraduates at that time believed very strongly that World War I was not just, that there was no point, and that they were unwilling to be sent to die. They said something that caused shock, fury in Britain at the time. And that was why, and that was when, the Oxford Union moved out of Oxford and into British public life, and, into British, and indeed, into the public life of the world. So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, take the brave step, make the opposition fear you, and vote against this motion at the end of tonight. Thank you.